Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Today we have episode 39, Digitizing for Durability and Embroidering for Extremes. Good afternoon, everybody. It is 2.30 p.m. here in the Mountain Time Zone in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I am in the lovely and brilliant studios, as you may know. And it is time for The Take-Up, right? It's time for Education Friday, and hopefully we will cap that off with a little bit of lovely embroidery education for you. This is going to be covering digitizing, embroidery, materials, garment selections, all kinds of stuff. So we're really going to get into this. Shouldn't be a really long episode, but you know I say that every time and never manage it. But for all of you people here, by the way, uh, thank you to Michael Downey, who's saying hi, and who have named you the reciprocators. And Mike, I will be getting back to you with a special prize on that behalf. Uh, all of you reciprocators, all of you people who are here every week to get your education, I am happy to see you here today. Let's go ahead and say hi to some of the folks who are already in. I trust we'll see a few more of you as we get going, but I want to get to the meat of this matter. This is something that I actually got asked last week to cover. I said, hey, maybe we could talk a little about durability. I said, yeah, let's talk about something that's a little functional. I mean, I know I talk a lot about a craft and creativity and art, but sometimes in the functional state, we can work on things that are important to uh, to our customers, to our projects, and also honestly have a little bit to do with both the art and the craft and what is necessary to keep things running and keep things durable, as we talked about today. But let's go ahead and say hi to the people who are here already. Uh, Cindy King saying, uh, did you send this cold weather over from New Mexico into Texas? It's not really cold here yet, so not yet, though we will next week be getting cold. So yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll talk about the weather report. We do this on the Two Regular Guys. If you guys have joined me in the morning podcast, Two Regular Guys, you know that we do the weather report coming in. I guess that's happening for me too sometimes. Uh, we have Ramona in. Uh, also a digitizer and who goes live herself. Uh, woo woo, it's Eric Day, much better than just playing Friday. I don't know, it's Eric Day for me every day and it's not always that great. <laughs> All right. So thank you for coming in, Ramona. Uh, Tom Farr, Buzzers Bay Embroidery. Hi from New Bedford, Mass. Happy to see you in as well. Uh, Jeff is in. Hello. Ready to learn? I don't know that I have anything to teach you today. You don't know, Jeff. I mean, you do a lot of example work and a lot of sampling, but we'll find out. <laughs> Hopefully there's something here where you can take away. There's some things that I've covered before, but I think that uh, going over this stuff is always useful to do multiple times because it doesn't always come up. You don't think about it. And the, this specific topic about making embroidery more durable through the way we design and digitize the materials we use is something that really you, you may not consider, but might make the difference between a really great product and servicing your client really well, uh, or coming off where somebody dis likes you over something you didn't think about that doesn't even seem important in the first place. So, uh, and Mike Medellini is here. Happy to see you, Mike. Uh, glad to have you in. Hi, Eric. Hi, everyone. Reciprocators ready to reciprocate? Yes. Ready to give back as we are given. That is what makes us who we are. Uh, also, Frank Dunn, good evening from over in the UK. Happy to have you here as well. Uh, David Young is in. Hey, David. Uh, Christine says, good afternoon, Eric, from slightly flooded northern Michigan. Stay safe, stay dry, stay warm. Christine, Christine Shreve, uh, who we have written together many a time, also doing her awesome podcast for Women in Business. Uh, Angela Mitchell saying hi. Hi, Angela. Happy to see you in. Uh, John, time to get warmed up before the weekend snow. Yeah, get warmed up and get amped up to do some cool stuff as we're going on to it. And Mike saying, I love it. The reciprocators are awesome. Yes, they are. And you are awesome for naming them. Thank you. You'll get plenty of plugs and goodwill for that, my friend. And uh, Justin Armenta, digitizer himself. Hello, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, Justin, and happy Friday to everybody. Uh, also, we have Bonnie in. Uh, hi from Asama Mish, Washington. If I messed that up, I apologize. Thank you for doing these podcasts. You know what? Thank you for being here. If you guys aren't here, if you don't interact, if you don't ask questions, if you don't be part of this, if you aren't reciprocating, then this thing doesn't make much sense for me to do. I'm here for you, and I'm glad that you're here. So thank you for being in the audience. Thank you for watching, and thank you for caring enough to learn more about your craft. Right now, each one of you, and I know, off topic, here we go again. I'm going to start speaking, uh, getting on the soapbox as I often do. Right now, every one of you, the people who are watching live, the people, if you're catching this later, you're searching this up, it's on YouTube, this is months down the road, years down the road, whenever this is for you, you right now are ahead of 99% of your peers, either in your craft or in your industry, because you are trying, because you are learning, because you care to try, test, and do your best. So each one of you right now should pat yourselves on the back. This is your time to make yourself better. And if there's anything I can do to help you do that, that's what I am here for. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, so Bill Nicholson also in. Hi, Eric from Cape Coral, Florida. 
All right. And Kingsbury Crafts, happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday to you as well. All right, folks. So with that, let's go ahead and start in. Like I said, this may not be a tremendously long show. It might not be a lot of bonus time because it's a pretty functional show. I'll tell a couple stories along the way as we go. But you know, this is how we are getting things done. This is what we're doing. We're trying to make functional garments that do what they're supposed to do. And part of that is durability. By the way, I have to say hi because we have Ron Goodwin in the house. Uh, awesome guy from Goodwin Graphics and always positive, keeping things good. Uh, yeah, preach, man. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you are in the choir, my friend. You are usually the one who is laying out that positivity for me and I really appreciate it. So everybody, let's learn. Let's do our thing. Let's get the best out of what we can do for ourselves and our customers. And let's start with durability, folks. What are we doing today? We are trying to digitize for durability. Uh, and we're also trying to execute and use our materials well so that we make durable garments that make sense for the environment in which they are used and for the people who are using them. I'm gonna go ahead and add to the stream my uh, an article that I use uh, pretty frequently and that I've kind of shown people quite a lot. And this is the version of it that I've done for um, Images Magazine in the UK, and that's something that we're looking for. Uh, usually, they are going to have some stuff where I will come back and kind of spin things for a for their clientele, for their people. But this is something that is really universal. Everybody has asked, hey, what can we do about a uh, workwear that is more durable? And so I'm going to go ahead and grab this link, and I'll give you guys the online version. If you like the online version, for sure, we're going to go ahead and send that out to you if you want to check that out. But what I'll say is a lot of people really like the magazine formatted version they do. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the comments as well as soon as I can get that to you. So here's that in the comments as well uh, with the page link. So go to the comments. If you're in the YouTube, there should be live comments. I'll throw that in the description later on. But if you're in Facebook, it's in the live comments right now as we speak. You can check those things out afterwards if you want to see some of the details that we talk about here and see some of the pictures up close. I'm certainly going to show you what I can here, but some of that stuff is going on now. So we'll go ahead and show you that. And let's go ahead and start with this. This is when the going gets tough is what they called it. You never know what they're going to title things. But, you know, that's one of those things that we're looking for uh, is to say, all right, let's get into what it is that makes the most sense for everybody. And I'll say when we're making these things, these creative kind of titles are something that they handle for us, but I still think it makes sense. The going gets tough when the garments need to be tough. This is what we do. So let's start talking about this anyway. Suffice it to say, you can see a picture up here of some text that's done in a durable fashion. We'll get to this later, why we do text a certain way, why we might choose certain stitches, why we would deal, th deal with things in that fashion. But here's the thing. It all is about making our garments the most useful as, that we can, making them make the most sense for the people who are using them. And part of this, before I get into the technicality of it, right, before I just get into the fact that we have these choices we need to make about our threads, about our materials, about our digitizing that makes this stuff more durable, before we get into that, I'm going to preach something that I always preach. It's the same way when I talked about disasters last week, right? If you go back to last week's take up, we talked about embroidery disasters and everybody was waiting for me to talk about tearing out stitches and co doing cover ups, right? And what did I start with? Communication, because the best way to handle an embroidery disaster is not to have it in the first place. And in commercial embroidery, especially most of the time when there's something that has to be torn out, it's actually because of breakdown of communication. So I talked about avoidance, right? Well, we're in the same boat here too. And what we're gonna talk about here is what I'm going to call, and with quotes enabled here, uh, environmental concerns. Now, why do I call this environmental concerns? Um, we have to be aware of the environment in which our garment is used, right? The environment in which the garment is used and seen. It, in, it certainly informs design. Whenever I talk about design and people talk about small text, it's another thing everybody expects me to tell you how to digitize small text. And usually I start out with, will the text be seen and is it important and how close will somebody be to it? And is the text important? We talk about the environment in which it will be viewed and whether or not the text is actually important to be seen before we worry about trying to execute teeny tiny text, right? Same thing here. Before I talk about the things we have to do to make embroidery durable, let's talk about knowing the environment in which the garment lives. So here are the things you want to know before you start on this, before you go into any embroidery situation where you're going to have to deal with this kind of stuff. When someone's talking about uniforms, workwear, something technical where you know that there may be something going on, we want to know where the garment's going to be used how it's going to be used. And yes, there is a how to some of these garments because it depends on what role somebody might have and who will use it. So it's also about that. What role do they have? How, where will they be? So what kind of work environment are they in? Who's going to be using it? What work do they do? And what hazards do that include? And uh, you know, 
how will it be used? Is it something that's going to be uh, used and abused, or is it something that's only put on once in a while, or is it an underlayer, an overlayer? How does that work? And most things are pretty reasonable. You would understand that a jacket is an overlayer. You'd understand that there's something that you uh, have to deal with as far as that. But there's things that you might not take into account. I mean, the easy ones are this, and we'll go over them more later. The easy stuff is when somebody says, all right, well, yeah, fire resistant. Now we're gonna go over fire resistant materials in a minute. But of course, if you're a firefighter, you might think about that right off the bat. What you don't always think about, yeah, firefighter welder, absolutely you think about that immediately. What people don't always think about is uh, people in racing, certainly fire suits, but you might wanna do the same kind of thing for somebody who's on a crew because there's a chance they might encounter flame. They don't think about that stuff. Or linemen and electric. That's the other time that people might wanna stock uh, fire resistant materials. I know that was one of our actual chief uses when I was doing embroidery commercial at the time, one of our chief uses was for the electric companies, for linemen, for people who are working with a high voltage. That was a place where you might have an ignition source and so you wanna have fire resistant stuff. The thing is, if you don't ask who's using the garment and you don't know who's using the garment, you might not know this stuff. When we're doing workwear for someone who is potentially going to have that problem, then absolutely going to be the issue. And you know, we will get into further the technicality of it, but let's start with that. And here's the first story, right? I'll go ahead and talk about this first story. This is around environmental concerns one of the ways that we want a client. There was a client who came into our shop and immediately was just fuming over the fact that he had been to two embroidery shops and he kept having ha having the same problem. He's like, boy, these people don't know how to do embroidery or something's wrong with their thread. Uh, the letters keep falling out. Now, if you're like me, you're like, the letters keep falling out. The first thing I think is like, okay, is this heat press? Is there something that's pressed on and it's not adhering? Is this some sort of coated garment? What do you mean the letters keep falling out? Sounds bizarre, right? Okay, sounds bizarre. Why would you have a, the letters fall out? And it turns out the guy's like, no, 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 no. It's regular embroidery. He brings in the garment and it's missing letters and there's frayed thread all over it. I'm like, all right, frayed thread, missing letters. Well, here's the thing, right? The guy is a contractor. What is their primary contracting thing that they work on is stucco and finishing. If you know anything about stucco, especially even the Southwest like me, then you do know stucco. A lot of it has a very sharp sanded surface. And so we've got this sharp, craggy, rocky surface on the on these walls. What happens? The back text, it was big jackets with jacket back text with huge art text over the top and bottom. And it's big, wide satin stitches. So what would happen is his guys would go put on one of these brand new jackets and then they sit up against a wall and slide down to the ground and sit down to eat their lunch. And what have they done? They shred all of these big, long, loose, loopy satin stitches. And as soon as you start cutting some of those big loopy satin stitches on that wide satin text, we all know what's gonna happen. It's gonna unravel. It's gonna unravel, it's gonna chew it up. It's going to be destroyed. So what is, what's going on here? Truth of the matter is the first thing I wanted to think when I, when he said Noah standard embroidery, I'm like, oh yeah, the other person's a loser. They didn't put in lock stitches. Something's wrong with these people. They are not taking account what's going on. They're not digitizing right. But if I looked at the file, I'm going to tell you the truth of the matter is in any other place where this was not being abused, there was nothing wrong with the way this was digitized. Those letters did not have overly wide satins. They weren't crazy wide. They were not uh, something you wouldn't do. It just doesn't fit into the environment. The way these were going to be used, which was either leaned up against a piece of stucco or thrown in and out of a truck all of the time, those big loopy threads were going to come loose. That and the other problem is, uh, I'm fairly sure because of the sheen of the thread that was there that they were using rayon. And I'm going to talk about poly versus rayon here shortly. Uh, rayon does not hold up to abrasion as well as polyester or laundry. So it's one of those things we'll talk about again, but Round threads, big loopy stitches, they're gonna get chewed up, they're going to tear off, they're going to fray. What do we have to do? We have to mitigate those problems. So I am gonna get back to it later, but this is the thing that we're talking about with environmental concerns. We have to know what's going on with that, right? So we need to know that we had those long loopy stitches and we're going to have to do something that the last section that we're talking about here, design against destruction, we're going to d change the way our design works so it works that way. And like I said, I'll cover it in a little more detail, but we'll go ahead and bring this up again. We'll go ahead and full screen this for a second. You can see up here that I am not using a standard satin stitch over here. You can see that it has some stitch penetration points. There are multiple kinds of stitches. I will discuss with you what kind of stitches you can use for this. But the truth of the matter is that uh, it it really is a matter of shortening those stitches up and not having that big, long, loopy look. So the big, long, loopy look to the stash is the big, the stitches being really lofty, that's what's going to cause these things to fray more easily. That's what's gonna cause these things to have 
that kind of problem. So we're going to have to design against that. And we'll talk about other things we have to design against and other things we might want to use. But let's start with that. Know the where, how, who of the garment. Where is it being used? How is it being used and treated? Who is going to use it? And then the other part of this uh, will bleed into the next section, materials matter, but we're going to bleed into it. We'll say also laundry. How is this garment going to be laundered? And that's why I'm going to say materials matter, right? Materials matter for multiple reasons. We'll talk about flame resistant stuff in a minute, but let's start with the most basic. I already said about thread, right? We're talking about tangling with thread. Tangling with thread. I like to title these segments, but they're all out of order because this thing goes all over the place. This is something that I say all the time, right? What's the word that I tell you everybody's going to get sick of? Holistic. This is a holistic approach. Every part of this, the file, the garment, the execution, the materials, the thread goes in together to be used, right? That's why we have to do that. These things all come together to make the final garment. They all have something to do with it. So let's talk about this material. Let's talk about the thread. And here's the thing. Number one, when we're doing this kind of work, the easy choice, I'll just lay it out there. The easy choice is to start with polyester. Polyester 100% is going to be uh, a little more durable. It's going to resist fraying. It's going to resist abrasion a little bit better. Um, it's going to have more of a resistance to any sort of that of the chemicals. It's going to launder. You can use bleach with it. It can survive dry cleaning. So in general, aside from the fact that rayon can actually hold up to a little bit higher iron temperatures, generally polyester is going to be the go-to for workwear. Now, fire resistant, absolutely not. If we're talking about anything with an ignition source, we're going to have to look to fire resistant materials and we'll talk about that in a second. But when we're talking about normal workwear, the, the contractor we're talking about earlier, the guy with the stucco crew, we're going to want to use polyester thread because the polyester is going to resist breakage. So if your question is when you're loading up your shop, what thread should I start with? Uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of business to business, if you're going to be doing a lot of construction or that kind of work, polyester is a good choice to start with. Polyester will hold up better than rayon. Rayon has a superior sheen, in my opinion, if you really like that shiny thread. And a lot of people in kind of home decor in fashion are going to use rayon. Rayon also uh, manages a little bit lighter tension, is less springy. So artistically, some people really love rayon. I actually started out my career with rayon but it also doesn't hold up to bleach and washing. And that's something I'm actually going to show you guys here. Um, when we have the screen up that has the, the whole uh, images article, you'll actually see that one of the things I showed is laundry symbols, right? Look at laundry symbols. Now, whether this is the garment you're using or the thread you're using, this is actually off of a thread card. Many thread cards will have the laundry symbols in there and you can see that this is important. Now, if you don't know how to use laundry symbols, I mean, usually your garment is going to have all this, these specs and information. I actually grabbed this, this is from Tide, right? From Tide Laundry in the US, you guys have, probably all have Tide. I don't know if it's the same in the UK and, and abroad, but let's go ahead and back off of it. Let me take my banner down so you can see what I'm talking about. Learn how to read laundry symbols. It's worthwhile just knowing what these things mean. You can see, can you machine wash it? And to what degree? Temperatures that you can wash things in. Uh, gentle cycles, drying, whether something will hold up to drying, whether it'll hold up to being wrung out, uh, heat for the dryer as well. And then this is the big one, bleaching symbols. Bleaching allowed over here on the left-hand side. In the middle, do not bleach. On the right-hand side, use non-chlorine bleach. You're going to want to know whether or not something holds up to bleach because if it doesn't hold up to bleach, it will bleed. Now, let me tell you how I know firsthand. This is a lovely lab coat for uh, a a hospital called Presbyterian that's local here. And we did a tremendous amount of work for them, right? And here's the thing. Most of the time, no problems, no harm, no foul. Everything's going great. Love doing work for them. No problem. Why? Because everything was set up for them ahead of time. Everything is as I expected it. Um, everything is digitized correctly for them. They have a special, I actually created fonts just for them. If you don't go back and go to back to the typography episodes where I talk about doing custom fonts to lock in corporate clients. This is one of those corporate clients and they had custom fonts I made just for them because it matched all of their uh, branding. So everything's great. Love them. They love our website. If you didn't see the e-commerce episode, it's another thing. Built the e-commerce website for them so they have a retail style experience for all of their uniforming. However, what happened was one day people were looking for uh, they were looking for thread. They were running out. We had a massive order coming on and somebody grabbed red thread that looked very similar to the other thread that was there, matched it. It was a good color match. Did not pay attention to what bin they got it from. We had a, an operator who was not as skilled because we were in a rush. 
And what did they do? They put on these lab coats, we had a large section of them uh, done with red rayon thread. What did that rayon thread do as soon as it got into industrial laundry in a hospital? Well, it bled all over and we had pink stains all over our white lab coats and they were irretrievable. So by all means, this also goes into storage. Clearly mark and clearly store all of your threads so that you know exactly what you're getting into. And that goes double, triple, quadruple, 10 times over for fire resistant threads. Now, generally, they're going to have some sort of markings and or a different cone color, something that's going to isolate them. But be careful, label your stuff right, correctly because you don't want to do as we did and eat a tremendous number of these things, right? So let's finish out with thread. We'll kind of talk about thread a little bit more. But let's go ahead and there's a couple comments here, here and we'll talk about this later. Uh, certainly, I want to get back to these comments later. We've got um, some about stitch types because remember I did talk about a split satin. We're going to talk about that later. But uh, Jeff says, one thing, I, one thing I think really applies, and I did it yesterday, uh, jujitsu and judo geese keep a length limit uh, satin at four to five millimeters because they go through some serious abuse. Absolutely. And we'll talk about this in the design section some more. But any time that things are going to get abraded pulled, stretched, twisted, dragged over something, then you're going to want to have a shorter stitch length. And that's something I didn't think about necessarily. Geese, I have done um, belts before. The belts don't seem to have the same kind of issue. But yeah, geese, be careful with that stuff. Anytime something's going to get abraded or pulled on or stretched, we have we all know that if you execute a satin stitch right, it's going to be lofty. It's going to be loopy. That's something that you have to watch out for. But let's go ahead and get on. We've got a couple more comments on thread that are there there but let's actually add another one from Ramona because these get lost in the shuffle I'm going to address these now even though we're going to get back to the section Ramona says I don't really care for split satin but I know it's necessary one would rather see it in a random but I can't see, uh, seem to figure out how to do that either uh yeah there are multiple ways that this gets done in software um some of them do automatic split automatic split satin is one that I've used before a length limit plus edge padding. So if you have software that does that, or it just limits the length of the internal stitches, but there's an edge padding and the edge comes in to make it clean and satin like on the edge, it just is the minimum stitch away from the edge. All stitch penetrations get cleared away. So you have a nice shiny satin edge, but you limit the length on the inside piece. And also if you have, um, and I've really only ever seen this in stitch artists, anchor stitching, whereas, whereas the return, instead of length limiting, every return angled stitch drops as a dead center point. So it's almost like a split satin, but only on the return stitch. And it helps you break up the pattern. Uh, so that's something you can look at too, but that depends on your software. Other people, if you don't have any of these uh, splits, you can also do sometimes a turning fill, which just means we're using a tatami style fill that turns with satin, with kind of the column like a satin stitch would. And when you do that, the other thing to look at is your minimum stitch length. You may be able to set your minimum stitch length higher. The thing is it may still have a small stitch on the edge that you don't like, but if you turn down that minimum stitch length, you're going to have longer stitches. Uh, so it's like, your maximum stitch length should be shorter than you would do for a satin, but then your minimum stitch length shouldn't be tiny like it would be on a standard fill. And then you might be able to get a little bit of edge quality we're talking about here. We'll get to that again, but it is really interesting. So that's something that you might want to do. Like, so you can do like a, you can kind of do a turning tatami or fill stitch kind of thing, but uh, length limit plus edge pad is what I use now. And that's really something that you're going to see at auto split is similar to that as well. So that kind of thing does get working. Let's go ahead and go to Christine. She's got a good comment about thread. And this is from a company she worked for, Ensign Emblem. And so this is a patch company, an emblem company uh, working in the US. And San Emblem has been making patches for industrial laundry since 1974. They've used polyester for years since it can withstand an industrial wash and dry. Absolutely. The life cycle of embroidered patches extended quite a lot once poly was introduced. Yeah, and poly was not always here. So this was at one point a new technology, but polyester thread as we have it now, uh, very durable, right? Absolutely very durable. And the other thing I'm actually gonna show you guys is the other kind of wear you don't think about, and that would be uh, outdoor wear or sun damage. And I know in New Mexico, I've done a lot of pieces for um, either for boats or cars or upholstery. I've done pieces that were meant to be outside all the time. I've also done things like tire covers for Jeeps. And uh, whatever you're doing that's going to be exposed to the sun, whether inside or out, it makes sense to think about color fastness and damage that way. In New Mexico, literally things will start to fall apart and degrade, plastics degrade under the intense amount of sun that we have, especially Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we are up high in the mountains. We do not have a lot of uh, air between us and the sun, if you want to say it that way. We are getting a lot of UV up here. And the UV damage does real stuff to it. So one of the things I'm going to say here before we, we'll get back into Firefighter, but uh, one of the things that has been really awesome for outdoor threads is the introduction, and really it's Madeira who's doing this, um, 
matte finish polyester threads. Their matte finish polyester threads frosted matte. It has like a ceramic compound that's in it. And this thread absolutely withstands UV like nothing else. And it has all the benefits of polyester. So that thread, if you are doing outdoor work, it is absolutely great for outdoor work. And they actually do now have a 30 and a 40. So with some of that big outdoor work, banner type work, uh, stuff like those big tire covers, the, that 30 will give you that coverage. If we ha if you haven't seen thick threads, I know we've talked about thread before and thick threads, that 30 is a thicker thread. We're going to get uh, be able to use fewer stitches to get more coverage. And that's something you might consider. So they've got a 30 and a 40 weight in that frosted mat and some colors. Uh, great to check that stuff out. Uh, it's a very flat e experience. So if you're looking to do the kind of carving that I show people, sometimes that will not play out as much. There's not as much highlight or shadow. But for large text, large covered areas, and for outdoor work, this matte finish is great. Plus, it does look really cool. And we remember we talked about last week, we talked about disasters and visible mending. You can see this is being used here for some visible mending because it looks very much like a construction thread. But it is a lovely, thick, uh, frosted matte. It's lovely, thick embroidery thread made for embroidery. And it absolutely holds up. So it's a very nice thing to do. Uh, check that stuff out and you can see that on the Madeira website. They do have these and the, they've got decorative seams using it that they show here and as well as using it in a kind of, uh, like I said, it looks much more like handwork because people associate handwork with like cotton floss and because it's matte finish, you can get all that benefit of poly without running cotton and have it be, like I said, incredibly color fast, incredibly song, strong stuff. So, and as they say here, they're, exper they're expecting it to uh, last quite a bit. And it has just an incredible kind of color, not only color fastness, but color depth and richness, but it really is very flat. So don't expect the shine and shadow you get for a standard thread. Um, what I will say here though, let's bring this up. This is another good tip from Cindy. Uh, when ordering variegated threads, double check them. Most of them are rayon. I've heard this too. People get some specialty threads, especially variegated threads, and they are rayon threads. So they do not hold up to the industrial laundry. So something to think about guys. I'll make sure you think about that. And then the other thing I'm gonna show you real quickly, um, I often use Madeira as an example because I've used their products extensively, especially when we're talking about specialty threads. There are other people who have fire resistant threads. So don't think it's all Madeira. I'm not just doing company stuff, but this is, they have the threads that I use the most. So the thing to remember when we're talking about uh, embroidery products, we're not just talking about thread. So whether you are doing stuff for firefighters, whether you're doing, like I said, linemen, firefighters, welders, racing and race suits, that's another big one. Doing the big race suits, those race suits are treated. In fact, I'll show you that as well. They're frequently treated cotton. And uh, there's something like this. This is Proban, which is a fire retardant. You'll see that that is often listed for race suits. Uh, there's often treated garments that are usually made of cotton. And what I'm gonna say is this, if you're not using a treated garment, then cotton over any sort of man-made like polyester, acrylic or anything else. So if someone comes to you and they are not trying to get a fire resistant garment, but you think they're in that kind of environment, do try and push a cotton garment on them first and explain yourself. Uh, Cause I've found that sometimes that's the requirement. I've had some people who are like volunteer firefighters and they are not trying to get fire resistant, crazy garments, but they do want just a polo shirt and under layer that is not going to melt. We all know that polyester melts if you apply fire to it. You do not want uh, what your garment to becoming napalm and sticking to you when it starts to melt. Uh, you'd really want to make sure you have something that's going to resist somewhat. Now, like I said, this stuff, Proban, is applied to things like racing suits and it's a fire retardant. But even if you're just selecting a garment and you have a concern that this might be an issue, even if it's not usually an issue, pick cotton garments ahead of anything else. Cause any sort of wicking material garment check, it's gonna have polyester in it generally. And so don't don't sell them polyester polo shirts as an underlayer, uh, look to cotton cause cotton is going to be a better choice. Uh, however, we'll go back to this. Usually you're gonna find with your threads that people will look for fire resistant thread. The thing you need to remember is that stabilizer is part of this mix too. And they do indeed have resistant stabilizers. So this particular uh, thread, this fire resistant thread, as you can see, it's made of aramid fiber. So this is going to hold up. So uh, it contains Nomex. If you don't know what that is, a DuPont, you know, trademark or what have you, but that is the fiber that we're talking about, the aramid fibers that contain Nomex, and that's going to resist flame and uh, ignition. The other thing you wanna look at, like I said, make sure you're using all of the different things together. This is holistic, right? So if we're doing fire resistant stuff, then you absolutely wanna make sure you're getting the stabilizer as well. 
Yes, it's going to be more expensive. Yes, you need to pass that on to your customer. They should understand this. And generally, if they have reasons why they're going to need it, they're the kind of people who will understand that they should have it and pay for it. Um, I have had people try and have me do race suits without it because it's expensive, especially when you have tons and tons of uh, sponsors. And when, uh, especially the one of the shops that I was in, they actually, when we had specialty threads, they charged the customer a kind of stocking fee for that thread. They were only doing a couple of race suits and they wanted us to just use polyester they didn't care. They said it was for taking pictures. They said that's what they were doing. Um, and that's something that I wouldn't do. Generally, I don't want to do a race suit. Anything that looks like a race suit or a fire suit, I'm not putting polyester through it because I don't want to be responsible for somebody having that melted polyester attached to their person. So I would say be careful about that stuff and know what you're getting into. And I actually have a couple more comments on this on the threads while we're here. Uh, Jeff says, I love frosted matte thread. You get some awesome looks. I wonder if they're 30 or 8 ones like 40 weight. I would say probably a little bit because when you're running 40 weight polyester, um, frosted matte, it runs more like 50. It runs thin because it doesn't have almost any kind of fiber on it. You don't have any fuzz on it. It's very smooth and treated. I find that it runs a little thin and it's actually, it's heavier for the length. Uh, in general, it just looks a little thinner. Also provides a really great fine execution. If you're looking for something like an engraving style design where you don't want a lot of shine, it's like black work, you'd want to see something that's very uh, uniform, great uniform thin lines out of that thread. But I do love that stuff. Uh, Christine, coming with some great material information from her time at uh, N. Martin Ensign and Emblem. Uh, QST Shield is the equivalent of Pro Band, which is no longer made. If you want to do fire resistant, look for QST Shield. It will cost more. I already tried about that. Yeah, it costs more, but uh, what costs the most are skin grafts, folks. And that's what you need to tell your clients. And I know that sounds pretty morbid and pretty gruesome, but the reality of this is that. And I'll say this. My wife uh, is in the medical field, spent a lot of time in emergency rooms, and nobody wants that. You don't want horrible burning. So remind everybody that safety is important and it's worth spending a little on and it's worth knowing what you're doing. And also, here's the thing. If you become an expert in this and you stock this for the right people, your clientele can expand because they will share with, you, with other people that that's who does their work. Not to mention, if you say, I have made myself aware, I've taken the time to understand what I need to do for fire resistant garments, then you can pitch that as a reason why you have solutions for that segment to other people. So this becomes a business gain. This is not a cost necessarily. Number one, we're going to make sure that we're making profit on the garments. We're going to charge for this appropriately. Number two, we're going to then learn enough that we can then tell everybody else who is in this M segment, if you need garments that are going to protect you, that are going to be the proper garment for your environment, we know how to make that happen and we stock thread, we stock our stabilizers that we need for that. So that's something that's important. Oh, and, and Jeff also kicks in on bobbin thread. It seems people, when they think about fire resistant, they only think about the embroidery thread. Every piece needs to be fire resistant. Yeah, absolutely. It's a sandwich and it goes right through. The way I say, I talk about embroidery and density and everything else where I kind of try and get you guys to think of the garment as this plane you're walking on and we're driving wedges of thread through it. It's three dimensional. We have to think of the weave of the material. The same thing is here. This is not just something we're putting on the front. It's not being applied. It's being put through the garment. So if we have this ingress of plastic material into an otherwise, let's say we get our fire resistant garment, we do the thread wrong. Now we have this melted stuff that can go right through the holes we made into the garment. Let's say we have the, the stabilizer wrong. Now we have a big patch of something that'll melt right up against our skin. These are, these are things we have to think about. This is the holistic method I'm telling you about. Think about all the different parts and pieces that go into making the garment what it is. So there, that's, that's all we really have to go with on fire resistant stuff. What I'm going to say is uh, for me, the reason I show Madeira is they have the entire system. Other people have the entire system as well. Uh, it's just good to get into the habit if you're going to do that kind of work to pitch this ahead of time, make people aware of what they have. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times where you're going to have somebody who's like, nope, this is, we are in this field. However, this these are being used for the office managers. This is for the accounts receivable. I don't need my electric company accounts receivable to be in fire resistant garments. And of course they don't. So it's not that you're going to be using it for everything, but it does make sense to get the colors for the people you need. And often, logos often have a couple of colors. You can use a cone breaker. If you're somebody who has multi-head machines, you don't want to stock up a ton of it. Uh, if you haven't seen what that is, it's where you can wind cones of your own thread and break up one uh, cone. I'd say check your time versus how much that stuff costs on really expensive threads. It might make sense, especially people also using reflectives for safety. That's another safety concern. This isn't a durability concern, but if you're using any sort of reflective materials, those are also usually very expensive. And by the way, this also extends to applique. If you're going to do applique on something that's supposed to be fire resistant, well, we can't put a big giant patch of polyester 
on it. So that I'll leave that be for the materials, right? That's really what we're talking about with materials. We just wanna make sure we're using the right things. And like I said, so they work in the right environment. They absolutely have to have the washability they need. So once again, hospitals, make sure you're using something that's going to hold up to bleach, hold up to high temperatures, hold up to industrial laundry. It should be something that's commented uh, in your thread, in your stabilizers, in your materials. And if not, ask the company that makes it, they will be able to tell you. Uh, same thing that has to happen with um, any of this stuff. We're talking about fire resistant stuff. Fire resistant threads are important. Uh, you wanna make sure, of course, to have your stabilizer, your bobbin, anything else you use, any other materials, including your garment, also be fire resistant if this is going on a person who might be near an ignition source uh, on a regular basis, because you want them to be safe and secure. Like I said, it's a sales point, not a cost if you treat it the right way. So those are the first parts of that with materials. I think that's important enough. Um, hopefully you like the couple of stories we had. Like I said, some of this stuff that we talk about, it will bring you more business and, and bring you uh, the ability to do work that gets you into segments that are profitable. Uh, Letty adds solvent issues as well. Yeah, if something is being exposed to solvents all the time or dry cleaned, you need to know that too. Um, it's important to make sure the garments work for what they're supposed to work for. And sometimes the answer is it's not going to. Um, there are times where people want something they can't have. Like we had Cindy who talked about a variegated thread, right? She's talking about the variegated thread. Um, if variegated thread and if the colors they want are only in rayon and that's the only available thread. In fact, I had a problem with that. I had a, a heart hospital that wanted to use a variegated thread. They had been given this thread by a previous company but they were using it on office garments they wanted to bring into the lab coats, can't bring into the lab coats because the only variegated thread in the colors that they wanted was rayon. And it was going to bleed and cause problems because once again, it was reds and pinks and immediately it's going to bleed on that white lab coat. Uh, sometimes the answer is this won't work. And that's okay because people love, let me see what I can do for you a lot more than they love. Yeah, those are your garments. I told you you wouldn't work. You learned them wrong. You own them. Yeah, they look terrible. Uh, Clarity on the lead end is always better than trying to solve the problem after it's already happened. So let's talk about that first, get that dealt with people. And when we're doing that whole environment review, uh, that's the time to talk about the reality of these situations. Sometimes these things just need to be discussed. And sometimes the answer is no. But like I said, a friendly, a friendly no, it doesn't have to be no, it can be let's find you another solution. Because what we can do with things like that, in fact, what I did for that one was I digitized things. I spent extra time digitizing a way to use polyester threads to get a similar look with some color in it, with some variation to the variegated look. And they liked that. And the thing is, on the lead end, before I was going to do multiple runs of these lab coats, putting in the time for digitizing meant that I could give them an artistic look that approximated what they wanted. Because what they wanted was the look, not the thread. We get it in our heads that they say they want variegated thread, they want variegated thread. No, they don't. They want a garment that has the look of variegation or some sort of play of color in the item that's being embroidered in the logo. They don't necessarily care how that's done. They want the effect, they don't want this, the process. The process is ours to figure out. The effect is what they're looking for. So remind, remind yourself that, look for a way out. Don't You don't always have to look for a no, but sometimes the answer is not the way you think. But we, all, we always have the chance to find solutions. And if we become solutions brokers, we do a lot better than being t-shirt machines, polo shirt machines that just make a thing. We are the people who provide solutions and help people figure out what they need and how to make it happen. So that's better for us. All right, so let's go back to our main article and the stuff we were working about. We talked about environmental concerns. So what environment is something being used in? The where, the how, the who. We talked about materials a little bit. And that, by the way, extends to your garments. We know that we, if we have something that's fire resistant, we need to make sure it's fire resistant all the way through. Also, we know that if we have industrial laundry, we need to make sure that the garment is color fast, that the thread is color fast, and that everything we do along the process can hold up to the kind of laundry it needs to hold up to. And that's the washing out, right? We need, we now know also that we can check out our thread. Our thread is going to have laundry symbols. It's going to have a ways to understand this stuff. And honestly, if we don't understand this stuff, the people who sell us the thread are happy to find us a solution for whatever it is we are trying to achieve. So we know that's the thing. We tangle with thread. If we are going to do uh, any sort of industrial work, we're going to do work with any sort of workwear that has to be in an industrial environment, in a construction environment, contractors, the stucco guy I talked about earlier, all of that is going to require us to have more durable materials. So we wanna to tend to go to polyester. If we wanna do outdoor stuff, like I said, I do highly recommend that polyester frosted mat thread because of the 
light fastness. So we're looking at all the different things that can hurt our garment and we're mitigating those problems with our material. So those are all things we've handled up to this point. And then the last thing we're looking for is to design against destruction, right? So what are we looking for? We want to make sure that we are always thinking ahead with the way we design our, not only our embroidery, so we're talking about digitizing, absolutely, but we're also going to talk about how we put together the garment, how we put together the overall design ethos to make this make the most sense. We want to design ahead of time against destruction. So what are some of the ways that we can do that, right? Certainly we're gonna talk about stitch length and all of that, but before we talk about that, like I always do, everybody's going to say, okay, he's just gonna talk about what kind of stitches to use and everything else. We already talked about that. We're gonna cover that again, fine. Not quite. The other thing to think about is when we're discussing that environmental kind of survey, where is this going to be used? How is it going to be used? Who's going to be using it? The other thing to remember is that we have multiple ways we can decorate a garment. We don't have to put big giant letters over the cross across the back of a garment if the garment's back is constantly going to get worn away at. Uh, also, when we're talking about other objects, it doesn't always have to be garments. Accessories are another place where we see a lot of these failures. And in fact, one of the ones I've seen multiple times is in bags, backpacks, bags, things that get thrown in and out of cars, left on floors that take a beating frequently are going to have to have some sort of thought put into where the embroidery resides as well as the digitizing. So what I want you to think about, no matter what you're talking about, whether it is working on jackets, whether it's working on bags, working on shirts, hats, whatever. Now hats, generally not gonna be a problem, right? When could it be a problem? If you had somebody who's a landscaper or who's an arborist and works in trees, now we're working with long threads being an issue again. But in general, we're talking about garments, we're talking about bags, Look for places where the wear is natural and don't decorate there if you can help it. Sometimes a customer wants to do something really cool and they like the look of a retail piece that's been done and you'll see that they want to put their logo on the side bottom of a bag. They want to put it along somewhere where it is frequently going to get worn, where it's going to be dragged on the floor, where it's going to come in contact with the other garment, or they'll want something on the back of a jacket and you'll find out that they're also a, putting a lot of abrasion on it, putting belts, backpack stuff on top of it. It's always a good idea to think about and discuss with them ahead of time, whether or not that position, that placement is the best idea. And then before that, we can then we can get into our digitizing and our way of mitigating that. But the first thing to think about is, is this thing visible where it's supposed to be? Is that the best, most visible way we can use it, number one? Number two, is this a place that absolutely you want to decorate in because it's going to be consistently seeing wear, consistently seeing damage? Now, absolutely, if the person is into that artistic look and they want to work with that, they want to put lettering up and down the sleeves despite the fact that the people are working with their hands and their arms, you know, sometimes the look of the piece is really what they're looking for and they want that. Then we're going to mitigate that through our digitizing principles that we're going to work toward making the stitches less likely to get snagged and damaged. However, the first thing we can do is design a look for them that mitigates that destruction. Or, hey, I like using multimedia as well. It may be time to do something that's not embroidery in the most damageable area. If you're working with an area that may be really easily snagged and damaged, we may want to look at other materials, other types of embroidery, other types of decoration. We can look at printing as something that can be used. If we're working on polyester and it's a light color of some kind that we can poly print, we can use patches of some kind. We can use applique because if we do our stitching correctly for edges on applique, very often it is going to be less long and loopy than we would have for standard embroidery. And even for small letters, sometimes applique small letters put on a polyester thread, uh, nice full coverage there. Yes, the satin's on the applique edge. If you're doing full coverage, we'll still have a chance to get snagged and ripped less by far than a full satin stitch coverage. And we talked about this earlier, but we'll get into it again now. Whenever I'm working on these kind of things, the first thing we think about, right, we're talking about digitizing for this and we're talking about design against destruction. The first thing is just to reduce satin stitches. We know the satin stitches are gonna be the primary stitches that are going to get tangled and caught. And this particular setup up here, you can see on the top of this, not everybody loves this. Uh, Ramona chimed in earlier and said she's not a real big fan of using split satins or randomly split satins. As you can see here, I've used alternating rows. I've used length limit with an edge here. So I've got a nice shiny edge. Uh, and yes, I'm seeing a little bit of texture in this center. Yeah, I will admit, 
if you wanted the high shine, if you want the shine and the shadow and the high crown, it just does break it up a little bit. What I will say is if you look at this versus a fully filled letter, now there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, I will show you this actual sample in a moment. Sometimes a fully filled letter is the right idea, especially when something's going to really be abused. We can use shorter stitches in that fill. They're much less likely to get snagged. And because they are offset, because the stitch penetrations are offset, unlike a satin stitch, it's harder just to literally physically get something into a channel and rip a few stitches because the stitches themselves are offset from each other due to the stitch penetration points being offset. Thing is, if you look at this piece, and, and if your judgment was, I want something to look the most like a standard satin stitch piece that it can, if you look at this piece, filled with a satin stitch edge, something that I really love for this kind of work when it absolutely must be very durable is filled with a satin stitch edge with a, with a short stitch length. As we know, length in stitches means loft. Loft means longer loops. Longer loops stand further off the garment. Usually we want that for coverage. Usually we want that for dimension. In this case, it's not what we want. But if that's the look we wanted, if you look at this fill, I like this look. However, if we're judging this against what a satin stitch looks like, this is much more satin-like than that fill, than the fill with a satin edge that I usually use. So first thing to say on this, I like the length limit plus edge padding, the random split or auto split, depends on what your software calls it. And what I'm trying to do is this, no matter what setting it is that makes this happen, I'm looking for an edge pad that doesn't end up showing one single gutter down the middle of the stitch. I don't like to have a split satin. A true split satin is not what I'm looking for because that imparts more texture than I want here. True split satins also don't have any of those offsets. Very much like a tatami would have, this has some offsetting between stitch penetration points, so it's harder to snag one, uh, like more than one stitch and pull it out or snag it. So when I'm doing text like this, I'm going to look for the length limit plus edge padding or an auto split. And I'm looking for the minimum stitch or the edge pad to be uh, sizable enough to give me that satin-like shiny finish on the edges, but not so sizable that on most of the column widths I'm looking at, that I'll have interference where both sides come together, those minimum stitch lengths or those edge pads and make a furrow, a line down the center. I don't want that. It also causes problems with coverage. You'll see more of the garment when those line up in a true split, whereas this does obfuscate more of the garment color underneath it. So when we're going large to a certain degree, unless it's a really, really large satin, we're going way over, you know, the 10 mil line. We're, when we have a big area that we're trying to fill, of course, I'm going to go fill with a uh, satin border on it for kind of the cleanliness, the crispness and texture. But th in this case, this kind of sat satin size, I'm going to look for that split and I'm going to use that minimum stitch. The thing is, if you just set up like, say, a turning tatami, a turning fill, uh, you're going to end up with the same kind of small stitches at the edge, and we're going to build up a lot of uh, small stitches on that edge. We're not going to get that satin-like look. We're not going to let it raise a little bit. In this case, I want to allow those edges to raise up a little bit, but I don't want them to line up the way they would in a traditional satin, and I don't want them to be incredibly lofty. So this is a good way to have kind of the best of both worlds. And actually, I use this pretty frequently even in more artistic stuff. Um, when I show you guys other durable pieces I've done, now we'll go ahead and take a look at this. Let's take a look at this a little closer. Um, this is what it looks like in that piece. I would say in this piece, I would probably go back, if I was doing this again today, I would try and avoid some of these lining up as much as they do. In the particular software I was using, you can see that we were getting some alignment here where you've got some furrows that are lining up and giving me some pretty good shadows. And that's not exactly what I'm looking for. What I will say is in the photography, it's a little bit hotter with a flash on it uh, than it is in real life. In real life, under regular lighting conditions, you're not seeing a ton of this. You do still get some shine and shadow, as you can see, but it does keep everything pretty short. And you're going to see that my minimum stitch lengths on these, my edge pads are actually pretty wide. They are still giving me a very satin-like look. Uh, for this one, it was for roofers. I was not quite as concerned about it. It did take a lot of abuse, but not like the stucco guys where we were losing letters every two minutes and they were jumping from embroiderer to embroiderer with nobody figuring out what the guy was trying to ask them. Uh, suffice it to say, though, you'll see that even in the tips of the wings, this is a big eagle that's here. I'm not showing the entire logo because I'm kind of trying to get some detail here. But even in the tips of the wings and other borders, anytime a satin got over a certain width, I'm using this kind of auto split. And essentially, um, 
all I'm trying to do, like I said, the overarching goal here is to keep from having really long aligned satin stitches. Anything I can do to break that up is going to help. For me, the artistic look here is to keep it as satin-like as possible. And I'll say some of these can be really effective. You guys have seen this before where I sh I've shown you my Acanthus monogram set where I, I uh, reproduced a piece that was from a, a manuscript. And this is on the side of a hoodie. That same stitch pattern is what's being used here in the acanthus leaves and in the flower petals. And if it's done well, you can actually use the texture from those gutters to help add shape to the piece. And I think on uh, done correctly, done well, it does actually add something to it. I don't think it takes away from it and allows you to have these really wide st stitches that still have some shine, some shadows, some dimension, uh, much in the way that you would have from using a satin. And I think that it still kind of has that carved look. And you can see from the other accents that were on the front of that hoodie that we uh, very much do have that kind of that kind of carved look. And as you can see though, yes, there is texture. I will call that out and say, you're seeing some texture, you're seeing some alignment, but by using kind of a high edge pad, but not high enough to join in the center and cause that furrow, you're going to end up with that kind of look where we still have some shine and shadow. It is a very satin-like look. Yes, there's some divots here, but you're still getting something that is similar to a satin look. And if that's something that the client wants, then that's probably one of the best ways you can achieve it. However, like I said before, you are going to see some issues with it. And I actually have on another article where I discussed this, um, you can see this piece, this is on that same jacket. I'm going to show you the jacket shortly. And this is some black letter text. It's fairly small, but this was done for a uh, car club. And they specifically said they wanted these things to be bomb proof to last for decades. And they were concerned about that abrasion. They were concerned about that car club, motorcycle club. So the idea is if someone spills it, in this garment, they don't want the lettering coming out. So I went ahead and used a texture like this, used that edge pad. And you can see the edge pad on this is pretty long and I am getting kind of a furrow in the center, something I wouldn't usually like. And you're gonna see there's a little bit more show through of the base garment in that. I think you do see a little bit more show through in the base garment. I will say that once again, we're talking about mitigating problems. If the customer's worried about the durability, a lot of the time they're like, "Can't how close can I get to what I used to have in a traditional satin stitch and still have something that looks cool? I think the texture still looks interesting. And despite the fact that I think, I always look back at my old pieces and think I could have done them differently. Um, this definitely still has a much higher chance of surviving being snagged or abraded than a standard satin stitch of a similar size. And so I'm actually gonna hold up the piece because the other thing we're gonna talk about, um, as I said before, is the is when you're having a really wide, uh, letter, a really wide column, I will often completely leave behind the idea of doing turning satins, turning fills, because as we know, the fill stitches just don't fill in the same way or look quite as good when they turn around a tight corner as a satin stitch would. And often I will completely eliminate the turning from it and just do a single direction or maybe a curved fill, often just a single angle fill that has a nice set of satin stitch borders. And sometimes as you can see in the uh, small detail that's down at the bottom of the C, this hook, since this is kind of a black letter font, I will often use a satin or a split satin, auto split, length limited satin uh, for any sort of small details, bars or borders. And this is what I use on the largest letters. Now, certainly looking at this, the other thing I could have done, maybe not on this piece, because we were working with some letters that weren't that huge. And because I wanted them to match other letters that were rather large, we ended up using fully embroidered work on this. I can see going back, especially on the largest lettering on this piece, that I might have used applique because a nice, well-attached applique with the satin border that was similar to this would have been absolutely excellent. And of course, it's going to resist abrasion like nobody's business because it's a fully filled piece of polyester twill. And that would have held out quite well. But here's the thing I'm gonna show. I'm gonna go ahead and hold up the garments. This is one I don't always show. Uh, because not everybody loves the subject matter when you do car clubs and when you do uh, motorcycle clubs, but this was for the road devils and it's a large piece. I am a large man. I'm about six foot four and I'm a, as broad as a barn door. So when I hold this thing up, I'm going to tell you, this is a pretty large piece. This is done on the largest hoop we had at the time. And uh, as you can see, these are big letters. Now, certainly these are a lot smaller, but they're no slouch. They are small letters, but they're not tiny. Satins are still gonna cause trouble, especially if they get snagged up. We actually use, even in these tridents here, these tips are a fill with a satin border. And then we have the splits again, we're using the uh, length limited satins in the tridents. And also in the lettering itself, this lettering is all done with single direction fill with those uh, very small satin stitch borders. They're pretty thin, they're not super thick, 
they just provide a little tiny bump of texture and we'll bring this back up again so you can see it, full screen layout. That little bit of shine and texture that's provided by that satin stitch really kind of sets it apart and makes it look better than just a flat fill. It gives it the texture of embroidery, which gives you that luxurious look that embroidery is so known for. And what I would say is it cleans up that edge because this is a cotton duck material. It's a really heavy material um, and it tends to tear up satin stitches. But what we've done is we use a low density satin on top of a fully dense fill. So I'm getting enough coverage and the satin's giving me some shine, but I'm not doubling coverage. I've got that low density satin that is just over the edge of the fill. It is not very far. It doesn't have a lot of gap on the outside edge. The fill is deeply inset into that satin stitch. And I'm using a lower density fill so that I'm not doing quite full density, but I am getting a lot of that lovely coverage. Certainly the density is gonna be higher on the little tail that's under the C here, but in the uh, border itself, it's a lower density. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. This garment has incredibly tough material and the material is really coarse. So this thing is incredibly coarse. The patches that were put on it, and by the way, that's another thing I'll talk about with uh, doing motorcycle stuff. This one has a non-edge patch. They wanted a weird rough edge patch. It was the way the original jacket was made that we've brought in. However, uh, generally when you're talking about patches like this, I've actually worked with motorcycle clubs where the patches outlast the garments and they're replacing the garments and putting the patches from one garment to the next. And I've done that several times where I have actually had somebody come in and they're reproducing a couple patches that didn't survive, but the rest of the patches we were actually, because we had sew on service as part of what we did uh, with our favorite clients, we would allow them to bring in their old garments. They would take off their old patches and we would actually take patches from the old garment and move them to the new garment for them. Uh, we charged enough for it, but it was something that was pretty rare. And I would say there's a lot of these people where the history of that patch is important to them, especially with uh, motorcycle folks. And so for them, uh, you know, that was a different kind of world. They wanted a really durable patch. And when we explained what we could do to make the patch really durable and hold up, they were all about it, despite the fact that it increased stitch count cost and honestly changed the look a little bit, made it a little more dull, made it less shiny like satin stitches are, but it is pretty interesting to do that too. And also this is something, and what's funny is I see this from Regina and she actually is one of the people who I've seen use this to great effect. Um, I'll go ahead and put this down here. Uh, I've used a light fabric applicant or a light fill, then a satin outline for extra large letter monograms. It covers great and causes less stress on fabric, 100%. If you guys looked back, remember when I, I talked about getting art from whatever source you have to or working for embroidery, there's a piece where I showed you guys I, I had redrawn and it was a really damaged piece. I went back in and made my own piece that worked on these chambray garments, these light denim shirts. And this is the technique I used and it's a technique I've used for this too. When a client says they want complete full embroidered coverage. They often just want the texture of stitches there. You can use something like a 50% density fill over a matching color applique and you get much less stress on the garment and it's really durable. And you can use some short stitches on that and still get that awesome color coverage. And I've actually done that repeatedly. Um, and it's a great thing to do. If you're doing actual patches and emblems, 50% uh, coverage fill is a fantastic way to get coverage that looks like embroidery without stitching something fully, number one. Number two, this is fantastic for garments that can't take that. Now that's a different kind of thing. We're not talking about durability here, but same thing can apply. Those letters, if they wanted that look, if, like I said, if I were going to do this again and my customer didn't say, absolutely, I want a fully embroidered look, you absolutely could have taken these and done some of this stuff in applique and done a 50% cover and with a nice satin edge fill or a nice satin edge for tack it all down. And it would have been fantastic looking. Now this particular piece with these big weedy letters that go down into small points and lines, I felt like, you know, applique in this piece didn't make as much sense to me for stitching, especially when the customer is totally fine with the cost and liked the look. However, if I were doing big collegial letters where I didn't have those small weedy tails and things that would be hard to place with applique, um, especially because we were doing pre-cut applique that was then being stuck down, I absolutely would have thought of applique as a, scent, a way to handle this. And in fact, um, another way I've handled both durability and coverage, I had a couple pieces where we did really big full coverage logos. And a lot of those really big full coverage logos that were completely covered, had big backgrounds on them. One or more elements were done with a partially covered applique for uh, motorcycle and car club. So definitely something that, to use. And in fact, if you've seen, and I won't try and pull it up now while we're live, if you've seen any of my regulators pieces, there's a big piece with a cowboy skull, cowboy hat and a skull face and all this stuff. You'll see that that one is done much in the same way as well. So uh, definitely 
absolutely Regina and Regina has done this stuff for bridal. I have seen a monogram the size of like a basketball hoop that she did that is on like organza or tool on incredibly light bridal material and it flows like water, very soft, looks like embroidery. Um, I don't have the pictures here, but I will have to post those at some point because they look absolutely fantastic. So definitely check that out. Regina is completely correct on how that stuff works and it looks great. It looks fantastic. So uh, yeah, definitely go for that light fill over top of applique. Fantastic way to handle that stuff, guys. So that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about durability, when we're talking about how to handle this in design, what are the things that we're going to deal with, right? Absolutely. When we're digitizing against destruction, right? First thing we're going to look at is position and placement. If the position and placement is somewhere that's going to take a lot of wear, that's going to be destroyed, that's going to be scraping up and down walls, that's going to be uh, dragged if it's a bag or a piece of, you know, any sort of like a cover, a bag, some sort of accessory, think about whether or not you need to decorate in that area or look to decorate in a different way, either with something like applique or with printing if you can, something that may hold up differently or not snag, not cause problems. Uh, next thing we're gonna do is absolutely look at stitch types. We know that a satin stitch, when executed correctly, when executed in the way we usually execute it, they're going to be long, lofty, they're going to stick up from the base. If we imagine the fabric, we know that satin stitches have some loft, especially if we have underlay that's structural, we have edge run rails and maybe double zigzags on top, we're holding it up and we're trying to make it have loft on purpose. Well, that loft is what's going to get it snagged, cut, abraded, what have you. It's going to get snagged on things. If somebody is a landscaper, it's gonna get snagged on sticks and twigs. If somebody is uh, you know, working in some fashion in somewhere where they can snag it or get it caught on something rough, that's what's going to happen. We want to limit that length. So what ways can we use to limit that length? Well, there's multiple ways we can do that. We can certainly look to split satins of some kind, length limit plus edge padding. So we get a nice satin edge on it. We still manage to shorten that length up, but it has a satin-like finish. We can go all the way to a uh, fill with a satin edge. And so we end up with that working in that same kind of fashion. We have a fill, unidirectional fill. So it, so that we have offset stitches that don't line up and don't have those long stitches that can get snagged, multiple can get cut or hooked on anything. And then we have that nice low density satin edge that rides just along the edge. It's just overlapped outside of the edge of our fill stitch so that we can get coverage without a tremendous amount of density. And we still get a nice clean edge. We get a little bit of shine, a little bit of texture as you might want in these letters. And that's something that's great for medium sized letters as you can see. So all we're really trying to do, right? No matter how we approach this stuff, we're looking to reduce the chance of something getting snagged, to reduce the chance of something getting hooked, torn, abraded, otherwise damaged. And the way we're gonna handle that best is by dealing ahead of time with those issues that might come up. And there's multiple ways we can handle that. Let's go back through it one more time. Number one, we know where this is going to be used and how. We know the environment is going to be used, who's going to use it, how they're going to use it, where are they going to use it, and how, what are they going to encounter. We know how it's going to be laundered, so we're going to work on our materials. We wanna make sure that we have something that's abrasive, that's resist abrasion, that resists problems with washing, that can handle heat. And if we're dealing with things that there's an ignition source, we have fire resistant materials, both thread and stabilizer, and of course, bobbin. Just the same way we look at the garment as something we wanna work on, we work on that. So polyester is what we choose for our workwear in general, because it's going to be more abrasive resistant. It's gonna hold up to industrial laundry and bleaching. Rayon is lovely. Rayon doesn't hold up quite the same way. And if it's fire resistant time, when we have ignition sources, fire resistant, everything. And when we're looking at that, if they don't choose fire resistant, try and get them to choose co cotton ahead of time, especially for garments, because cotton's going to beat any sort of polyester or acrylic. So we know about laundry. Polyester, again, make sure that your laundry's right. Check about dry cleaning. Know how it's going to get laundered. If it's going to be under high laundry uh, usage, if it's going to have to get dried at a high heat, Whatever it is, look ahead of time, talk to your manufacturers and find out what's the right solution for you. So that's how we're gonna handle that. Also, if you have UV exposure like we do in the Southwest, if you're doing something outdoors, really do think about the um, polyester frosted mat because it just has extreme UV color fastness. That's more durability. Last thing, of course, we're design. Design against destruction, shorten up those satin stitches if you can, use length limit plus edge pad or auto split if you've got that 
or turning to Tommy with a higher minimum stitch length if you have that, or go all the way if you have those other letters that are extra large, or you just don't want to use any of those, you don't like the way those look, and get yourself a nice fill with a small stitch length. So don't go with those five millimeter, 4.5. Go down a little bit that lower stitch length fills with a nice narrow satin stitch border that's going to clean up that edge just outside of the range of the initial shape. <laughs> so that's that's dimension, that's digitizing for durability, that is working with materials, and hopefully that made a lot of sense for everybody. I think that's a pretty simple thing that we talked about. I think the last thing I'll kind of lay out there as well, the same way I talked about the uh, motorcycle folks who are coming around saying, yeah, we want to move our old patches to our new gear. Well, that same sentiment made me think that one of the other ways we can handle this is by using emblems. Uh, emblems are often rather easily replaced. And so if we're talking about a garment where the garment is durable, but is likely to see some wear, sometimes what we want to do is just use emblems so it's easier for us to replace them down the road. And this was actually another thing that came out of working uh, with guys who are motorcycle dudes. Uh, they had garments where they've got a leather vest that fits them like a glove that they've been wearing for 30 years. And even if they spill it and tear up the embroidery, they didn't want to waste that leather vest. They're going to recondition that thing and they're going to put it back on. Well, when they don't want to lose the battle vest and some Sometimes the best thing you can do is cut off the old patch and put it back on. If you do direct embroidery, as we know from last week talking about disasters, it is much harder to remove direct embroidery than it is to uh, snip the stitching from a patch, especially if that patch was not heat applied, was just stitched on, then it's a lot easier to take the edge stitching out that you might have used to attach a patch and put a new patch on. So the other thing to think about, depending on the usage, is maybe to think about using uh, patches or emblems, which generally are made with polyester. Uh, one th other thing I wanna mention before we get finished here is when you're looking at those thread types, do remember that if we use specialty threads like fire resistant thread, we may not have all of the colors, we may not have all of the thicknesses and weights that we expect. So you may have to change the way you're doing things. If you have moved to like all 60 weight thread because you wanna be like a lot of the emblem and patch companies are and do incredibly fine detail, if you then have to move to fire resistant threads, you may find that they do not have 628 threads or not in all of the colors you expect. So do when you're checking out specialty threads, particularly things like the fire resistant, uh, look at what you have and you may have to communicate with your client about either color selections or the fact that the kinds of threads they have may limit the execution you can do on the back end. But still, that's what I would really say is important is to have the conversation with your client know more about what they're doing in their business and how they're using things, and then address those issues with this full holistic toolkit that you have, right? You have the ability to change your design work, your placement, your garment, your thread and materials, and to work differently with your digitizing to arrive at a solution that's going to make them happy and keep them safe and provide durability so that people aren't cursing you for your cheap product. Because whether or not they are beating something up in a way that is not normal for a garment, they may not think that is their issue. Uh, so being realistic with them about the way a garment can hold up, number one, and number two, using all the tools that are at your disposal to make the garment more durable can make your company look like it has the line on some sort of better technique, and it does. That's the thing. When I first told that story, right, about those people coming in with the jackets that were losing letters, I was so ready to say this person didn't do their job. That's my fault. I didn't take a very charitable response to that. I was ready to say their digitizing was bad because I was ready to swing in and save the day. The truth of the matter is they didn't make any, change, uh, any uh, choices that I would necessarily change in a standard embroidery. The thing is we all get hung up on standards. We get hung up on the basic settings that we program our normal template full of settings or our quick styles. And we use those same settings over and over no matter what, because it's easy and we know they work. The truth of the matter though, is there's always different ways we can handle these things. And if we aren't exploring these different ways and saying, you know what? Yes, this is the way machine embroidery is usually done. Maybe it's not the way it needs to be done for this particular client or this particular use case. If we don't do that, then we become stuck in those standards and we become slavishly stuck in that template, in the settings that are all either already in our software or that we usually use. So think about the holistic approach 
what it means to people, how things are going to be used, and what you can do to make them their best. So I have a couple last comments for everybody. We'll go ahead and call this bonus time, but that's really the end of uh, digitizing and embroidery for durability and extremes. And if you have questions, if you have comments, I would love to have them in the comments, even after, if you're watching the replay, still get into those comments. Uh, people here, the reciprocators are willing to talk to you, and I'm certainly gonna jump in and answer things if you comment later down the road. But let's go ahead with the last few comments. Uh, Mike Muldowney made it back for bonus time. Not a lot of bonus time this time, my friend. Uh, not going in for like 30 minutes. But that's, you know, when we talk about something that's fairly straightforward, like this durability, I don't think it needs a ton of bonus time. Um, I would happily answer Q&A if you guys are still here and want to do it. But honestly, I think that it's pretty simple. You, you know what materials will hold up the best and you know what you need to do to make your digitizing work. And a lot of that is just limiting really long stitches and making sure that everything's locked in and working. So that's really the thing. Make sure you have your lock stitches certainly and all the stuff that is necessary to keep stitches in, but shorter stitches, less snagging, materials that don't break and rip easily and things that hold up to a little abrasion. But yeah, not as much bonus time this time, but you know what, we're gonna have more stuff. If you have stuff you wanna talk about, absolutely hit me with topics, hit me with questions. Candy says, your show went by way too quickly. Very informative, lots of stuff I didn't know, thanks. I am glad to hear that. If I teach you one thing, if each week you've shown up to this, this show, uh, and or if you go back into the stacks and listen to previous shows, as a lot of people do, if you learn one thing and take it away from it and it saves you some time, think about this. For me, number one, my work is done. I'm happy. Number two, if you save five minutes once and then you do it again next week and you do it again in the entire career, you save five minutes, 10 minutes a day, a week, even on something that I told you, for me, that means that I have saved you hours and hours and days of your professional life and likely given you some sort of uh, foundation on which you can build more things you need. So that's what I'm hoping for, guys. I, I really think that if you learn one thing and take it away, don't worry that you didn't get everything in the world out of it, especially, hey, what do you want for free, guys? <laughs> It's not even a paid seminar. If you learn one thing that saved you some time, uh, then I think you've probably gotten your value out of your hour that you spend with me. And, and hopefully you enjoyed it in the way and uh, listening to my goofy stories about people shredding their jackets as well. Uh, Candace does ask a question since we're, I'm saying we're officially in Q&A. Um, what material do you recommend for patches? Now, we have some people on here like Jeff Fuller himself who does a ton of, a, a ton of patches, usually tries to... Um, jump in and tell you, but this is what I'm gonna say no matter what, uh, the gold standard material that is usually used for commercial patches is going to be polyester twill. I like a fine grained polyester twill. You can go to companies like Enmart or there's other companies that also do it. Gunold has twilly I know that I think Jeff uses. Um, polyester twill that is fine grained is going to give you a nice result. Uh, it's not going to interfere, be coarse and, and cause issues with your quality of your stitches. And that's the thing. A lot of people think patches and they think stiff. So in order to try and get that stiffness, they will use super coarse materials like cotton and duck or something like that because they really think the material is what's providing the stiffness. Usually the stiffness is there uh, added by a crinoline layer or by a thermoplastic layer that's, uh, you know, like heat seal or some other sort of plastic layer in the back that makes the patch stiff either artificially or due to the fact that there's just more layers of material. And that's usually what's going on. If you look at a commercial patch that you bought from a patch company or souvenir shop, whatever it is, usually you're going to see a fine grained polyester twill that uh, holds up to detail very well, um, melts under a hot knife, which is good if you're using the hot knife cutting method. Um, I can post later, I've got a, a good article. If you go look up uh, make patches on any embroidery machine, you'll usually get my article that has a few different air ways to do it. And if you go back into the stacks on the take up on my YouTube channel or on my Facebook, um, go check that out. There are two episodes where we talk about both different kinds of patch material methods and uh, cutting and things like that. And we talk about some edge digitizing settings so you can make some patch edging. So certainly um, very much like that kind of stuff. And I will go ahead and get people back in and say, um, here is Jeff saying, good old Twilly is very fine grain. So that's one he uses. And Enmart's patch material is also excellent. Enmart's should be because the parent company from Enmart's uh, Ensign Emblem is a full on emblem company. So that makes a lot of sense that it would be good that way. So that's something to in interesting there as well. Uh, and here's Jeff saying, we just need to stall for five minutes for official bonus time. I think we're gonna hit it. Uh, hour 15 is bonus time officially on this show. We'll hit it as I go through the last comments here, folks. Uh, Frank says, thank you. 
you, Eric. Interesting subject. Thank you, Frank, for showing up. Christine says, I think these are valuable to watch for people who may be responsible for buying embroidery, not just doing embroidery. You understand how it works. You make sure you're getting items done properly. It's the same thing I say about digitizing. If you're never going to digitize a stitch, but you know how to talk about digitizing, you will get better digitizing from the person you have do that work than you could if you don't know what it is. So learn the terms and topics and the ways the digitizing is done, even if you never wanna push points around and do it yourself, absolutely. Uh, Jeff says, I get something from every take up, definitely worth more than the cost of mission. I should hope so. <laughs> I hope it's worth more than free folks, <laughs> but thank you. I'm glad that you get something out of it. Uh, Joe Rita says, it's very informative, thank you. Uh, we got some congrats for Brilliance. Not, Brilliance is really cool. And you know what? I'm, I'm glad that uh, people are seeing that. Something I've worked on, really hard. And Brian Bailey, who is the creator of Brilliance, has been absolutely improving it leaps and bounds at all times. It was already a great software and we've been adding so much. So thank you for that. Uh, you guys know I'm working at Brilliant Studios. Now, all the stuff I told you today, you can do in any software. Um, they are different. Link limit of edge pad is, is not common and the reverse stitch is really ours. However, um, I've worked in many softwares. People who know me know that I have a long career before Brilliance and I worked in multiple softwares during that career as well. But you can use different settings to get this that we're looking for. Just remember, we're trying to limit that stitch length, offset the penetration points and have a nice satin-like border, which means we're gonna have the minimum stitches and or the edge pads set to try and move some of those pen stitch penetrations out away from the edge. Uh, let's see, and Mike says about patches, I like a poly cotton twill, like a work shirt for patches that like a more subdued appearance. Uh, the poly thread is flashy enough, the matte twill makes it look awesome versus it all being shiny with poly twill. You know what? A proper patch poly twill isn't very shiny. Some of the stuff that I have used before, the stuff that's from stalls that's made for cutters is very shiny and that's something you may have to work with. Um, and let's go, a couple more comments that I actually have to head out. Uh, I'm gonna tell you this, this too, folks. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, my power brick is not functioning correctly and not recognizing, so I'm about to cut out, power's gonna go out on my laptop. So we're gonna finish this up really quickly. Last couple comments. So if I disappear, that's why I disappeared, folks. Uh, so anyway, Mike says that, yeah, I would agree. Uh, but if you look at like the stuff from, and Jeff says this too, official recipient of gun, uh, Gunnold's Twilly is poly cotton, just more poly than cotton. Uh, very nice stuff there. And what I'm gonna say is that if you look at like Enmart's polyester twill, it's not shiny either. When you do like the, the PS poly twill from Stahl, which is something I use because it works on a roll fed cutter, like a cutter plotter, uh, roll fed cutter plotters, um, they have tend to need a roll mounted, like a carrier mounted roll of material. It made it really fast for me to do patch production, but yes, my patches were shinier. And so, yeah, I would agree with you. Um, looking for a less shiny one is a great idea. So uh, that's how we do, that's how we do, folks. Uh, Regina says thank you once again, and uh, Julie just kind of left us back from uh, from a digitizer with forty thousand stitches. Oh my god! You know what? Depending on your detail level, I can see it, but that sure is a lot of stitches. I'd want to look at the size and see what how that was done. Check your densities on that one. But anyway, folks, let's go ahead and stop it here before I get cut off, before I want to get cut off, since I'm having some technical issues here. Um, what I'd like to say is, if you're working for durability, we all know what we need to do. Think about where the garment's going to go. Work toward the material that's going to fulfill all the needs of the garment and its laundry. And digitize both for a garment where it makes sense where you're putting the logos and for stitches that are less lofty, smaller, tighter to the garment, and don't have the long, loopy, lined up stitches that a satin does. So with that, folks, I'm gonna call that for this week's take up. It's a little shorter than usual, but we're in official bonus time. And I'm hoping we're gonna do some more fun stuff next week. We're gonna have more of kind of a Halloween episode, I think. We're gonna talk a little about safety. Uh, I will put a warning on there before anybody goes in because there might be some pictures of, uh, let's call them thread tattoos. Some of my friends who have put their hands a little too close to the needle. We're gonna talk about some other cool stuff as well and probably discuss some uh, cultural, artistic and fun stuff as we go along. But next week we'll have a little bit of fun and anything you guys wanna hear, get to me in the comments, find me on social media, E-R-I-C-H Campbell, that little H makes it easier to Google me and get me at ericcampbell.com. If you can contact me and tell me there's something you really need to learn, it may end up on a take up coming soon. So with that, all of you reciprocators, thank you for coming and happy Friday.